is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. When I feel afraid, think I've lost my way, still you're there right beside me. Nothing will I fear as long as you are near. Please be near me to the end. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light to my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. Thy word is a lamp unto my feet and a light unto my path. You're the light unto my path. Hello and welcome to Sound Words. Sound Words is the theme that has been selected as a course of study for the Church Street Church of Christ this year. It is based upon some words that Paul writes to Timothy. Therefore, do not be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me his prisoner, but share with me in the sufferings for the gospel, according to the power of God, to which I was appointed a preacher an apostle and a teacher of the Gentiles. Hold fast the pattern of sound words which you have heard from me in faith and love which are in Christ Jesus. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verses 8, 11, and 13. In keeping with this theme, then, of sound words, this program is simply a Bible study. How better to discern sound words than to listen to the Word Himself, Jesus the Christ? So we are using this weekly time slot to simply study the Bible together. We are studying the Gospel of John. I hope that you will continue to tune in at this time each week to participate in this fascinating study. I hope you have your Bible ready so that you can follow along and possibly even take notes along the way so that you can prepare yourself for even deeper study on a personal level. Well, here we are. We have finally reached session number 39, the conclusion of our study of the Gospel of John. It has been a long study covering nine months with regard to time, but hopefully you feel like the time invested has been well worth it. I know that I do. It is always a good thing to study the Bible. It is always a good thing to study with specific instruction, specific detail, so that we might come to know God in a more personal way. What I'd like to do today in our final session is I want to go over chapter 21, of course, the final chapter of John's Gospel. We're going to hit some of the highlights there, and then I hope to have in the time remaining an opportunity to go back with you over the highlights of the entire book and hopefully remind you of how all of these pieces of the puzzle fit together. I believe that John's gospel is a perfect tool to use to teach someone the gospel, that it can be used in and of itself because it communicates the truth that Jesus is the Son of God. And John says whenever a person believes that and acts upon that, then he or she can have eternal life. And that's our whole purpose for living. So before we get to that summation, I'd like to go back where we left off last week, and we're going to pick up our study reading from John chapter 21. You may recall last week that in John chapter 20, the entire chapter is dedicated to the resurrection of Jesus, the empty tomb that is found on that first day of the week, and Jesus' first appearances to his disciples. As we pick up the reading in John chapter 21, it feels like the mood has changed a little bit, and this is often referred to by students of John's gospel as the epilogue. It's almost as if the story has already been told in the first 20 chapters, 
And now we're going to have kind of a summation, kind of an epilogue, the end of the story. So let's begin our reading today in John chapter 21, verse 1. After these things, Jesus showed himself again to the disciples at the Sea of Tiberias, and in this way he showed himself. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathanael of Cana in Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, and two others of his disciples were together. Simon Peter said to them, I am going fishing. They said to him, We're going with you also. They went out and immediately got into the boat, and that night they caught nothing. But when the morning had now come, Jesus stood on the shore. Yet the disciples did not know that it was Jesus. Then Jesus said to them, Children, have you any food? They answered him, No. And he said to them, Cast the net on the right side of the boat, and you will find some. So they cast, and now they were not able to draw it in because of the multitude of fish. Therefore that disciple whom Jesus loved said to Peter, It is the Lord. Now when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he had removed it, and plunged into the sea. But the other disciples came in the little boat, for they were not far from land, but about two hundred cubits, dragging the net with fish." It's an amazing story because it's a reminder of the way Jesus first met his disciples. Luke tells of an account in Luke chapter 5 where the disciples have had a night of unsuccessful fishing and Jesus tells Peter, among others, to throw the net on the other side of the boat and when they do, they catch so many fish as they haul them in, the boat begins to sink. They call their friends over and fill their boat with fish, and it's so full of fish, it begins to sink. And in the midst of all of this, you can almost see a gleam in the eye of Jesus. You can almost see a smile cracking across his face. And Peter sees everything that's happening, and he falls down before Jesus and says, Go away from me, Lord, for I am a sinful man. It's almost as if that scene is being replayed here in John chapter 21. Jesus is reminding them that even though he has been crucified, he has been buried, and he has been resurrected back to life, that he is still Jesus, that he's still the Lord of their lives, that he still has control over the situations in life, even something that seems as simple as fishing. It's fascinating that Peter has said, I'm going fishing, almost as resigning himself to going back to the only thing he knows. What do we do now that Jesus has died and been buried and now been resurrected? He says, well, I'm going back to my life. I'm going fishing. And the others that are there with him say, we're going too. So it's an interesting encounter Jesus has once again as he manifests himself after the resurrection once again to his disciples. I want us to read on now, starting in verse 9. Then as soon as they had come to land, they saw a fire of coals there, and fish laid on it, and bread. Jesus said to them, Bring some of the fish which you have just caught. Simon Peter went up and dragged the net to land, full of large fish, 153. And although there were so many, the net was not broken. Jesus said to them, Come and eat breakfast. Yet none of the disciples dared ask him, Who are you? Knowing that it was the Lord. Jesus then came and took the bread and gave it to them, and likewise the fish. This is now the third time Jesus showed himself to his disciples after he was raised from the dead. So Jesus is inviting the disciples, as he has so often done, to come to him. Not only to come to him, but to eat with him. It's another time Jesus is going to be sharing a meal. And something about the sharing of this meal is another reminder that this is not some spirit. He is not some ghost. He is not some figment of their imagination. But he is able to eat breakfast with them, the very fish that they've just caught, miraculously, at his hand. Now, as the disciples finish their breakfast, we have an amazing encounter that takes place personally between Jesus and Peter. Remember that just before Jesus' crucifixion, he had predicted to Peter that Peter would deny him three times before the rooster crowed. We read, as we read through the crucifixion account in John's gospel, that Peter did exactly that. Now, when Jesus had first made that prediction, Peter was very dramatic, saying that he would never deny his Lord. 
But just as Jesus had predicted, Peter three times denies knowing Jesus, and then he hears the rooster crows, and we're told that he goes out and weeps bitterly because he recognizes at that moment what he has done. How can he ever make that up to Jesus? As we read on in John chapter 21, I think this is an important segment here because it's John's way of saying this is Peter getting reinstated in the mind of Jesus and more importantly, in the mind of Peter himself. Let's read in John 21, starting in verse 15. So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my sheep. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him the third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. It's an interesting encounter, and you have to ask yourself, why does Jesus ask the same question three times? How much does it take for Peter to convince Jesus that he truly does love him? But it's almost as if the reason Jesus asks Peter three times if he loves him is because he's giving him an opportunity to three times say, I love you, Lord, as if to make up for the three times he said, I don't know the Lord. So now Peter is back in the good graces of Jesus. He has been reinstated, and his life, as we read on beyond John's gospel into the book of Acts, where we see the beginning of the church, we'll notice that Peter's life takes off. He becomes a powerful, dramatic spokesman for the Lord from this point forward, teaching and preaching about the resurrection of Jesus Christ. So it's a significant moment where Jesus is communicating, I haven't forgotten you, Peter. I still love you, Peter. And I still have a very important function for you to fulfill in my kingdom. And then as we move on, we see that the expectation is spelled out here because it gets even more detailed. Let's continue our reading in verse 18. Jesus says, Most assuredly, I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, follow me. Once again, we see John bringing this back full circle. What does Jesus say when he first calls his apostles? Follow me. What does he say here in John chapter 21 as the story is being wrapped up? Follow me. Then Peter, verse 20, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved, that is John, following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, but Lord, what about this man? Jesus said to him, if I will that he remain till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Then this saying went out among the brethren that this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die, but if I will that he remains till I come, what is that to you? In other words, this is kind of a scolding parent almost, where Jesus has to say to Peter, I'm speaking to you, Peter. I'm telling you or challenging you to follow me. It doesn't matter what John or anyone else does. That has no concern to you. What concerns you is I'm calling you, will you follow? This would be good advice for all of us even today. Jesus is calling you. Jesus is calling me to be his disciple. And sometimes we look around and we say, well, what about him or what about her? And Jesus says, these other people are of no concern to you. Your only concern is yourself. I'm calling you. Now, how will you respond? And then John writes these words as he concludes the gospel. This is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. And there are also many other things that Jesus did, which if they were written one by one, I suppose that even the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. 
Amen. Once again, John, the author, is pointing out to us that the story of Jesus is so big, it cannot be confined to any set group of words, including this very thorough, this very important document that he has written about the life and the teachings, the ministry, the death, the burial, the resurrection of Jesus. Nothing can tell the full story, he says. I'm only giving you bits and pieces. I'm only giving you highlights of the greatest story that's ever been told. And that's how John chooses to conclude his gospel, saying there's so much more that happened, but I think this is enough. This is enough to convince you to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. So that concludes our in-depth textual study of the Gospel of John. In the time that we have remaining then, I want to go back and look at sort of the bird's eye view, the big picture of the entire story that we've talked about over these 39 weeks as we've studied all 21 chapters of John's gospel. I want to take you back to John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. This is where we began. It seemed at the time like an odd place for us to start a study of the Gospel of John. Rather than starting with John chapter 1 verse 1, we started with John chapter 20 verse 30. And the reason is because this is, I believe, John's thesis statement. This is where he tells us, the reader, what he's trying to accomplish by writing this account of the life and the ministry of Jesus. So once again, in John chapter 20, we read these words starting in verse 30. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. John states his purpose there. He says, this is my clear declaration to you of what I'm trying to do. This is why I'm writing this story. I want you to know, just as we just saw in John chapter 21, verse 25, there's no way any person can tell all of the details of Jesus' life. No way the books of the world could hold everything that would need to be written. John says, I recognize my limitations. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to tell you about signs that Jesus performs. I'm going to tell you about some miraculous events in the life of Jesus, not simply for the miracle value itself, but to demonstrate to you that each of these signs points to something about the nature of Jesus. There are many other signs that Jesus did that I didn't take the time to record here, but these that I've recorded, I think, are sufficient to help you to believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God. And so we determined from this key statement that there were three key words to John's gospel, signs, believe, and life. Each one of these words can be found in this thesis statement in John chapter 20, verses 30 and 31. Again, truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. A person sees signs. The signs point to something about the nature and the character of Jesus. That person then is led to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, And once that belief is established and a person responds obediently to Jesus, then there is life. And again, it's not just existent kind of life. It's not just inhaling and exhaling kind of life. It is a full life. It is an abundant life. This is the word Jesus uses in John chapter 10 when he says, I've come that they may have life and might have it more abundantly. So the key words to John's gospel we established from the very beginning, signs, believe, life. That's the format around which he builds this whole story. So if John doesn't tell all the signs that Jesus performed, but only shares a handful of them, what handful does he share, and why does he pick these? John shows us seven signs through the gospel. And each of these signs point to something about Jesus' mastery over a certain aspect of life. We began with chapter 2. 
the changing of water to wine demonstrated Jesus' mastery over quality at this wedding feast because it wasn't just any wine. Even the master of the feast said it was the very best wine. In John chapter 4, we saw the second sign that John records. It was healing the nobleman's son. It demonstrated Jesus to be master over distance because he was some 20 miles away from the person he healed at the time of the healing. A powerful demonstration of Jesus' control even when he's not physically present. The third sign that John records is found in John chapter 5. Healing the lame man by the pool demonstrates his mastery over time because this man had been lame for 38 years. The fourth miracle or sign that we saw Jesus perform was recorded in John chapter 6. Feeding the 5,000 with only five loaves of bread and two small fish demonstrating his mastery over quantity for obvious reasons. Another sign is demonstrated in chapter 6. Jesus walks on the water, demonstrating his mastery over natural law. No one had ever done that before or since. In John chapter 9, we have the sixth sign. Healing the man who was born blind demonstrates Jesus as master over misfortune. Even this man who had no choice in the matter, who was born without the ability to see, can now see because Jesus is master over misfortune. And finally, John records in John chapter 11, raising Lazarus from the dead, which shows him to be master over death. It's fascinating when you put these signs together because they still speak to us today. They still preach to us the message of the gospel, the good news of Jesus Christ. He is the master over quality. With him we have the very best. He is the master over distance. It doesn't matter how far we feel we may have drifted from him. He still can have power to work in our lives. He is the master over time. It doesn't matter how many years we may feel that we've been separated from him, Jesus can close that gap of time and change our lives. He is the master over quantity. There is no problem too big. There are no problems too numerous for him to be able to control. He is the master over natural law or even we might say natural disasters. He is the master over misfortune. Sometimes when life deals us a hard blow, he can still be the master of our lives And ultimately, and most importantly, he is the master over death. Even death cannot conquer him. And so these seven signs are critical ones to show us the message that John wants his readers to see about Jesus. He says, if you look carefully at these signs and look at what they point to about the nature of Jesus, you will see that there is enough there to believe that Jesus is the Son of God. And when you believe that and act upon it, you will have life, life forever in his name. As we went through our study, we also saw as a memory tool some key words or some word pictures to remind us of what happens in each of the 21 chapters of John. We had a word picture for Jesus for each chapter so that we can remember the story. In chapter 1, we saw Jesus as the Son of God. The deity of Jesus is emphasized there in the beginning. Jesus was there. In John chapter 2, we saw the humanity of Jesus. The word picture is son of man. Chapter 3, Jesus is the divine teacher. This is the chapter where he has the discussion with Nicodemus by night. In chapter 4, Jesus is the soul winner, where he meets with the woman at the well in Samaria. In chapter 5, Jesus is the great physician, where he heals the lame man by the pool. In chapter 6, Jesus is the bread of life because he feeds 5,000 people with five loaves of bread and two small fish and then speaks about being the very bread of life that God has sent to the world. In chapter 7, Jesus is the water of life because at the Feast of Tabernacles, he identifies himself as that life-giving water that can bring sustenance, nutrition, and relief to all mankind who will come to him. 
In John chapter 8, he is described as the defender of the weak because of his encounter with the woman caught in adultery. In John chapter 9, Jesus is the light of the world because he brings light into the world of a man born blind. In John chapter 10, Jesus is the good shepherd who lays down his life for the sheep. In John chapter 11, Jesus is the prince of life because he raises Lazarus from the dead. In John chapter 12, Jesus is the king because here we see the beginning of the last week of Jesus' life when he rides into Jerusalem on a donkey and is lauded as a king. In John chapter 13, Jesus is a servant because we see him girding a towel around his waist and washing the feet of his own disciples. In John chapter 14, Jesus is the consoler because as his disciples grieve, he tells them about the coming of the Holy Spirit. In John chapter 15, Jesus is the true vine because he teaches about staying connected with him in order to find life. In John chapter 16, Jesus is the giver of the Spirit because he speaks of the coming comforter to fill in the gaps in the teaching and the instruction that he's going to leave for his disciples. In John chapter 17, Jesus is the intercessor. We have the longest recorded prayer of Jesus there. In John chapter 18, Jesus is the model sufferer because there we read about the crucifixion or the trial and the beating. In John chapter 19, we read about the crucifixion. He is the uplifted Savior. In John chapter 20, Jesus is the conqueror of death because we read of his resurrection. And in John chapter 21, Jesus is described as the restorer of the penitent because of his interaction with Peter, bringing him back into full fellowship, you might say, and getting him ready for the coming kingdom. John's gospel is a powerful story, and I hope somewhere through this study you have found some nuggets of truth that have been helpful to change your life. I hope you've seen the signs. I hope they've led you to believe that Jesus is the Son of God, and I hope you are experiencing abundant life in Him. Thank you so much for spending this time with me over these past 39 weeks to learn about Jesus, who is the Christ, the Son of God, who saves us from our sins. May God our Father continue to richly bless your life. You have been listening to Sound Words, a presentation of the Church Street Church of Christ in Lewisburg, Tennessee. I am Kyle Bolton, the pulpit minister at Church Street, and I would like to personally invite you to come and share times of Bible study and worship with us each week. We meet every Sunday at 9 o'clock a.m. for our morning worship, followed by our Sunday school for all ages at 1015 a.m. Then we meet again at 6 o'clock p.m. for our evening worship. We also have a midweek meeting for devotion and Bible study on Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. I hope to see you there. Have a blessed day. Holy words, long preserved for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart. Oh, let the ancient words impart Words of life, words of hope Give us strength, help us cope In this world where we roam Ancient words will guide us home Ancient words Changing me and changing you, we have come with open hearts, oh let the ancient words impart, holy words of our faith handed down to this age, came to us through sadness. for our walk in this world. They resound with God's own heart, oh let the ancient words impart. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We 
had come with open hearts, oh, let the ancient words impart. Ancient words ever true, changing me and changing you. We have come with open hearts, oh, let the ancient words impart. We have come